In this third part of lecture 4, we're going to discuss in detail how to implement the column generation algorithm to solve our passenger mixed flow problem. We'll start by discussing the column generation algorithm, going into detail on how to implement the algorithm to solve our passenger mixed flow problem. We'll then conclude the video with an illustrative example that hopefully will help you to understand the algorithm. In generic terms, the column generation algorithm is composed by four sequential steps. In the first step, we solve the current restricted master problem, or RMP. We then determine which new columns to add, and if any, in the third step, we add columns to our RMP problem. In the last step, we check if there are more columns to be added, and if not, we stop our um, algorithm. To start this process, we need to define a set of columns that we will uh, use to guarantee that we can solve the RMP for the first time, obtaining a feasible solution. That is point A in our flow chart. When we solve the RMP using an LP solver, we obtain not only the solution to our RMP, but also the value of the dual variables. The dual variables give us information about how to improve the objective function in our RMP that is point B. These dual variables are essential for us to understand which columns to have. This is done by solving what we call the pricing problem. This pricing problem can be straightforward, in which we just compute a kind of a score for each decision variable not yet considered in our restricted master problem. Or it could be a new optimization problem that helps us to create new columns or decision variables that we eventually can add to our restricted master problem that is point C. We have the columns that we determine to have good impact in our objective function. In the traditional column generation algorithm, we will add only the single column that has the highest impact to our objective function, or the first one that we have obtained that has a good impact to our objective function, while in the advanced version of the algorithm, we can add all columns that have an estimated good impact in our objective function in one go. This is done in point D in our flowchart. Finally, we'll need a stopping criteria to know when to stop adding new columns to our problem, that is point E. In the next slides, we'll discuss each one of these points one by one in detail. So let's start with point A, how to generate the initial set of columns. This depends, of course, on the problem that we are solving. In most cases, an heuristic or the creation of select variables in our problem is needed in order to have an easy way to define an initial set of columns that makes our problem solvable. In the case of the problem we are trying to solve, this is even easier. We can use the knowledge we do have of our passenger mixed flow problem and, more specifically, we can benefit from the key path formulation that we have adopted in the previous video lectures. We know that we have always the possibility to spill passengers to the fictitious itinerary. In this case, passengers will be lost and no revenue will be generated with them. We'll assume that if we give the possibility to passengers to fly in their key path, they will always accept and fly their key path. And in the same way, if we have to allocate them to the fictitious, they will also have to be spilled because they do not have any other option. Following the concept, behind the key path formulation, we can forget the passengers that will be allocated to their key paths. But for all the other itineraries, we can use the fictitious option as a buffer, as an escape to find an initial solution. It can work in a similar way to select variables in some problems. That is, in an initial solution, we will consider the fictitious itinerary to spill as many passengers as needed in order to respect the flight capacity constraints. So, we can just start by adding these decision variables that regard spillage to these fictitious itineraries, to which we call itinerary 0. Once we have a solvable RMP, we can use our LP solver to compute the initial solution. At the same time, we can ask to the solver to give us the values of the dual variables. These are the optimal values of the decision variables of the dual problem of our RMP. There is a dual variable for each constraint of our RMP problem, our primal problem, and respectively, each decision variable in our RMP problem is a constraint in the dual problem. The dual variables are also called shadow prices and they tell us the value of relaxing the constraint by one unit. 
So they give us information about the added value, the marginal value, of giving more flexibility to our problem with regard to the respective constraint. For our passenger mixed flow problem, let's call pi i the dual variables associated with flight capacity constraints and sigma p the dual variables associated with itinerary demand constraints. So one can see the pi i as the marginal value of adding one extra seat on flight i and sigma p as the marginal cost of transporting an additional passenger from itinerary p through the network given the solution that we have obtained at that moment. The question is how we can use these dual variables and why they are relevant to us. To understand this, we need to recall the simplex method and the way that we choose to move a decision variable to the base, or in other words, to make a non-basic variable a basic variable. If you don't remember or know the simplex method, this is a time to pause the video and revisit your operations research lectures and books, for instance, from Euler and Lieberman. Introduction to Operation Research. In particular, you can have a look at chapter 6 of this book, which discusses the dual theory. It is relevant to understand what is the relation between the formulation of both problems, the primal and the dual, as well as what is the relation between the objective function of both problems, and how to select a non-basic variable to add to the base in the dual simplex method using the primal-dual relationships. What we know from the dual simplex method is that the selection of the non-basic variable depends on the slack that we do have in each constraint to improve the objective function value by increasing by just one unit the variables included in that constraint. If we do that for the dual problem, checking the slack in each constraint, we are in fact at the same time checking the slack of the decision variables in our primal problem. And that is exactly what we want to know. Remember, a constraint in the dual problem is a decision variable in our primal. This slackness tells us what is the contribution to the objective function by increasing the decision variable that we are assessing. It tells us if the benefit of increasing that decision variable in our primal uh, objective function is higher than the cost associated with that decision variable in that same function. If so, it is a good idea to increase the value of that decision variable or to add it to our problem if it was not there yet. We can compute that slackness by subtracting the right-hand side of the dual constraints to the left-hand side of these same constraints in the dual problem, according to expression on the slide. For our minimization problem, if there is at least one constraint with a slackness lower than zero, we add that respective decision variable to our RMP. The column generation algorithm then uses this dual simplex method concept to select which columns to have. This process is what we call the pricing problem. Looking at our formulation and the slackness expression, we can reformulate it to specifically address our problem. We select the coefficient from our constraints, the IHAs, underlined with an orange line here in this slide, and multiply them by the respective dual variables of those constraints, underlined in red. To the sum of these multiplications, we deduct the cost value in the objective function associated with the decision variables under consideration, and these are underlined uh, in blue. By computing this difference, we are computing what we call the slackness of each possible recapture possibility. And by solving our restricted master problem and obtaining the dual variables, we should have all information that we need to compute this likeness for each decision variable not yet considered in our restricted master problem. We can go further. We can reformulate this likeness expression to make it eventually more intuitive. Looking at the second version of the expression in the present uh, slide, we can now understand what we are computing when we compute the likeness. So the value of pi tells us what is the contribution to the objective function of adding one capacity unit in the flight i. If we are not using the full capacity, these values will be equal to zero. There is no added value. If we have a demand higher than the capacity, then the respective pi value will be higher or equal to zero. On the other hand, the values of sigma will let us know 
what is the additional cost of spilling or reallocating a passenger added to the demand from itinerary P, given the current solution to the RMP. In summary, our selectness tells us what is the difference between the modified fare of the original itinerary P and the modified fare of the alternative path. Being the modified fare, the original fare of that path, minus the added value of spilling or reallocating passengers to another itinerary. If the modified fare, subjected to the recapture rate, is higher than the modified fare of the key path, then it is useful to have the recapture option to our RMP. And this is actually the logic behind the determination of the columns to have. We compute the slackness for all possible combination of itineraries and check if they are negative, negative to our minimization problem. If any decision variable is associated with a negative slackness, we say that this is a decision variable or a column that price out the columns that are already in our RMP. This means that the spill cost can be reduced by adding these columns to our model. Otherwise, if the slackness of all known basic columns are non-negative, we don't have any column. As explained before, we can have columns one by one in each iteration of our algorithm or a set of columns in one go. So we can decide to have just the column with the highest negative slackness or the first one that we have computed with a negative value and run another iteration of the column generation algorithm. Or we can add all the columns with a negative slackness in the same iteration. Which approach is the best? Well, it depends on the problem we are trying to solve but it's always a trade-off between having to run many iterations or just run a few iterations but with many columns that will perhaps be redundant. When we stop the algorithm? Well, we stop it when we do not have any more columns that price out the existing solution. But to guarantee that we do have a feasible and optimal solution, we also need to check other considerations. We need for instance to check that all the constraints are satisfied and that we only have non-dual and that we only have non-null dual variables to the case we are at the limit of the constraints for our prime problem. These last conditions are known as the complementary slackness conditions. Okay, this perhaps is too much to digest, so let's try to see how this works with a very simple problem with three uh, airports, 10 flights and 15 itineraries. There are also a recapture options between 17 combinations of itineraries. I will provide on Brightspace the Excel file with this input. The goal is to define what is the best mix of passengers from the multiple itineraries to transport in our network, or if you prefer, according to our key path formulation, what passengers should be spilled in order to minimize the spill costs. The first step is to compute the right hand side of our demand constraints. So we can see that we'll have to remove 62 passengers from the flight 102, 56 from flight 301, and 36 from flight 201. On the other hand, there won't be any problem with flights 303 and 204. They have a capacity that is higher than the, un the un they have a capacity that is higher than the unconstrained demand. So eventually, we can use these flights to recapture some passengers from other flights. We will initiate our RMP with only the decision variables related with the fictitious itinerary, which we will call uh, itinerary zero once more. So the objective function in this initial version of the RMP is the sum of the fares of the itineraries multiplied by the respective decision variable that allow us to spill passengers. This will be the value of the revenue that we will lose if we spill a passenger from each of these itineraries. Remember that the fare associated with the fictitious itinerary is equal to zero. We don't make any money with these passengers. We do have a list of constraints, which in this initial RMP only involves the spill options. These are the options we will possibly use to reduce the demand for each flight in order to respect the capacity that we do have in our flights. I just represented here the first four constraints. Of course, there are more constraints to be added regarding the flight capacity and also a few more related to the demand constraints. But okay, we can solve this problem using our uh, LP solver. And then we'll get an objective function value equal to $46,580.
Moreover, we can obtain the value of our decision variables. The non-null decision variables tell us how many passengers we have to spill from each itinerary in order to respect the capacity in each flight and to minimize the loss of revenue, of course. The other decision variables are null, meaning that for those itineraries, the passengers will follow their key path. If we revisit our constraints, we can understand the values obtained for these non-null decision variables. Like in the first constraint, I'll have to spill 62 passengers either from itinerary 1 or 7. But because itinerary 7 is $50 cheaper per passenger, we opt to spill all 62 passengers from itinerary 7. We can also request the value of the dual variables from our LP solver. For the flight capacity constraints, we do have 10 flights, so we do have 10 constraints in the primal, 10 dual variables in the dual. However, only 6 of these 10 dual variables are non-null. And we can see that the non-null variables are related with the constraints in the primal problem that refer to the flights with an unconstrained demand higher than the capacity available. So, for instance, we can see that we can improve our solution by $100 if we can increase the capacity in our flight 102. We also obtain dual variables for our itineraries. These refer to itineraries that do not have any option to recapture. So they will end up not being used in our pricing problem. Speaking about the pricing problem, the next step is to compute our pricing problem, which for our passenger mix flow uh, problem is not more than the slackness associated with all our decision variables not included in the RMP problem. If we compute this slackness, we observe that the decision variables to recapture passengers from itinerary 1, 2, 4, 3, and eventually 11, 12, have a negative value. This means that these decision variables can help us to reduce our objective function value. So we will have these to our RMP problem. So we have to update our RMP problem accordingly, adding the new columns in the objective function and the constraints. In black in this slide, you can see the new elements added, and in gray, what was already in the, in the initial version of our problem. Note that some of the new columns, or decision variables, will show up with a negative sign in the constraints, meaning that they were added to the constraints and create a possibility to reaccommodate passenger in that flight that were removed from other flights, or eventually, even to replace passengers that have the, these flights in their key path with passengers that are recaptured from other flights, from other itineraries. Okay, if we solve this new version of our RMP uh, problem, we see that we reduce our objective function value by more than $1,500. We get new decision variables values for both the primal and the dual problem. Please be aware of the meaning of the new decision variables from our primal. The value of 31 in our decision variable T34 means that just 20% of these passengers, of these 31 passengers, will accept being recaptured. And therefore, only 6.2 passengers are traveling on itinerary 4. The remaining fraction of these 31 passengers will be lost. It will be equivalent to uh, allocate them to the fictitious. If we solve again our pricing problem, we'll observe that none of the remaining decision variables has a negative slackness, so we'll stop our column generation and this is the optimal solution to our problem. Well, I hope this exercise helped you to understand how the column generation algorithm works and how we can smartly choose which column to have at any time. We can use this algorithm to solve many linear optimization problems. The challenge is always to define the pricing problem and to choose the set of initial columns to start with. The algorithm is very useful, especially in the case that the pricing problem is used to generate new columns. This is the case where we do have many decision variables that is almost impossible to know them all in the beginning of the optimization process. This happens, for instance, when we address the fleet allocation problem or the crew scaling problem, to just name a few in the airline planning framework. Well, I'll see you in the next lectures. Bye-bye.